And I want to thank everybody for coming to our At Heaven's Door uh, premiere launch event. It's a conversation between Evan Alexander and myself as the author of At Heaven's Door. And I want to welcome everybody. I know that people are coming in from Zoom. They're also coming in from Facebook. So thank you all. Uh, I also want to say that if you're on Facebook and you're doing chats, and even on Zoom, I think we have members of our Shared Crossing team who will re be responding to some of your questions. If your questions don't get answered in real time, we're going to be recording them in the next couple of weeks, uh, next week, I should say. Stay on, um, follow us on our social media, and we will provide responses to your questions. Um, the other thing to say here is I want to say a bit about uh, our mission. We have people still coming on, so I'm going to talk about the Share Crossing mission. And that is that uh, in 2013, I started this project. And I started it because I wanted to help people transform their relationships to death and dying. And to do that, the focus was to focus on these incredible spiritual transcendental experiences that happen uh, at the end of life. And then what we wanted to do is bring people together in community. We started locally in Santa Barbara, and then we moved across the country and in events just like this. This is probably the biggest one we've ever done on live, thanks to all of you but we're gonna be doing more of this in the coming year. I'd also like to say that for uh, those of you who are interested in learning more about Shared Crossings and what we do, come to our website, sharedcrossing.com. We have excellent resources that we've worked on for a decade to put it in real user-friendly language. And just in the last month, we uh, published our story library, which is these beautiful vignettes, videos of experiencers sharing their uh, shared crossing experiences. So if you go on, you'll see seven right now. We'll be adding to it. Special thanks to Michelle Johnston, our senior researcher who put that together. Um, so there's that resource as well. I want to say to those of you who have been following us on social media, thank you so much as a way of saying thank you to you. Um, in the next couple of days, go on that social media, follow us, and you'll see that we're going to be having a book giveaway, Evan's book, Proof of Heaven, and then my book as well will be available. There'll be a drawing. There'll be instructions about how that's going to be done. So with that, uh, now I'm going to begin by, uh, I just want to see, uh, we have more people coming on, but we're going to start, I've already started, but we're going to, uh, I'm going to be begin by um, inviting uh, Evan here, introducing him. Now, Evan, I saw your video go down. There you are. Don't worry. I'm here. Excited. Ready to roll. <laughs> All right, good. I got scared for a second, but I mean, I know all of us near-death experiencers, we do things funky with the electrical stuff, so we can disappear and come back and all that. But I want to say that, uh, you know, it is an honor to have you here at this launch event, Evan, and I'm going to introduce you and I'm going to say a little bit about how we met. Uh, the first thing to say is that in a certain way, Evan needs no introduction. His influence in the world has been profound, um, he, but he didn't, you know, his real influences with his book, Proof of Heaven, but he didn't start out that way. Uh, he was already extremely influential and successful. He was associate professor of neurosurgery, excuse me, at, yeah, neurosurgery, big word for me, neurosurgery at Harvard uh, Medical School. So after his tenure there, he had his near-death experience and that experience transformed him forever. And he wrote about it in his, uh, incredible book, Proof of Heaven in 2012. That book so resonated with people around the world that it was, it was eventually translated into 40 different languages. Also, it was on the New York Times bestseller list for 90 weeks. 42 of those weeks, it was number one. So the influence of Evan and his experience is profound. And I think our, our culture has been transformed because of it. Uh, the other piece to notice here is that he wrote another two other books, and that is his second book was Map of Heaven, really about the science behind the near-death experience. And then he wrote a third book with his partner, Karen Newell, called Living in a Mindful Universe. These three books, this compilation, in a certain way tracks Evan's evolution from a medical scientific materialist to a, a person still a scientist, but how he sees uh, consciousness at the center of the universe. And I hope he'll say more about that uh, during our conversation tonight. Personally, I met Evan in 2013, and I met him at the Afterlife Conference. He had just really begun his ascent, and we had a lovely evening together. 
And from that point forward, uh, we've maintained, you know, really a, a lovely collegial relationship. He came to Santa Barbara later in 2013. He presented to our community in three different events, one that had 900 people, uh, really uh, has had a, a profound influence on our local community. And I should say that Ions of Santa Barbara uh, by Barbara Bartolome was a big part of hosting that as well. And so um, we stayed in touch and it was a, we really bonded when he invited me to be a part of a conference that he was the lead on. Uh, it was at Sivananda Ashram in the Bahamas. It was a title of the conference was I think con continuation of consciousness or continuum of consciousness through human death. And we were there with uh, Paul Arand and Karen, and it was a lovely time. Uh, but it was there that uh, Emin uh, introduced me, or said that he would introduce me to his agent, Gail Ross. And so I met Gail and uh, had a very similar ascent in a certain way as Evan did, because now I'm writing, I have written this book with uh, Simon and Schuster, just as Evan did. And uh, so here we are, full circle. And like I said, I just have a debt of gratitude for you, Evan, for having supported me and the project for now almost 10 years. And so I turn it over to you because you're going to moderate. And here we go. All right. Well, thank you so much, William. And I congratulations on Pub Day, on this being the first day for At Heaven's Door to bless this world. I, I must say, ever since I first got to know you, uh, you know, back eight or so years ago, through multiple conferences and everything, I realized what an extraordinary contributor you were to this. I mean, for one thing, you started much of this, as I'm sure you'll tell, with your own NDE, a very profound and powerful one, back when, when you were a young man. And I think that, plus your uh, research interest and your, your extremely compassionate interest in human beings and helping them to come to understanding in these deep um, uh, and challenging situations uh, is a tremendous gift. And I think that is what is especially reflected in this newest book. And that's why I'm so excited uh, to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, it, it really has a lot to do with the power of shared death experiences. Uh, you know, my own NDE was for me a game changer. It completely awakened me to a, a, a kind of a bigger understanding of consciousness beyond the body. Uh, and I, I know I heard many uh, people after my talks would uh, come up and share a story and they'd, um, many of those were, were near death experiences, but about one in 20, I would say, and probably more than that, because I didn't recognize them at the time, but uh, were, were shared death. They weren't in somebody who was ill. They were in somebody who might've been a thousand miles away from a loved one who was in, you know, in medical crisis. And I didn't know how to label them until I read Raymond's uh, Raymond Moody's book, A Glimpses of Eternity, and went, oh my gosh, these are shared death experiences. And then, of course, uh, uh, getting to know you, I realized what a profound gift you were bringing to the world in your intensive, scientific, uh, thoughtful study of these phenomena. Um, and I think that uh, it, it's really revolutionizing the way we look at, uh, certainly the way I look at uh, life, the afterlife and consciousness. Uh, as you know, I've worked now for the last 13 years with many scientists around the world. For those who think that, you know, the whole discussion is science versus spirituality, it's not. Uh, there are hundreds of scientists involved in consciousness studies who are totally uh, on board with this kind of deep investigation of these kind of phenomena. And, you know, our knowledge of physics and of science in general does not violate this at all. Uh, especially with quantum physics, it's completely allowable, uh, things like afterlife and these kinds of experiences. And that's why I think that books like yours that really go into detail of, of cataloging some of these uh, extraordinary stories and the way you give practical advice to people into how to cultivate uh, shared death experiences, I think that is a real tremendous gift. And it's important to the world at large, this whole discussion is, uh, because we have such a fear of death in our culture. And in many ways, this understanding that's coming to all of us is much more refreshing and liberating because it suggests there really is a soul and that this is uh, you know, something we have relationships, uh, that binding force of love that so many end years uh, experience is such a gift. And it, so it really can help heal our very uh, kind of polarized and conflicted world. Uh, has a lot to do with uh, healthcare 
end of life care, but also much of what we understand about consciousness has to do with healing. So in many cases, I think we're going to find much more extraordinary abilities for people to heal the more we investigate uh, this uh, deep relationship of consciousness and our emerging reality. And uh, I think that's, that's enough of my kind of preamble. What I'd really like to do is jump into some questions for you about your marvelous new book. Uh, I'd like to start by asking, what is a shared death experience? You know, I was afraid you were going to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, here we are. So, yeah, the shared death experience, um, it really is goes like this. Somebody is dying and a caregiver, loved one, and in some cases, even a bystander will report that they feel like they shared in this transition from this human realm into the afterlife. And what they see is that they're in 51% of our cases, they actually feel like they're accompanying the journey with the dying into a benevolent afterlife. They actually say they see them, witness them in some way in this transition. So that's really the, the fundamental uh, basis for, of a shared death experience. And I should say that the dominant motif is one of journey. This sense that when we die, we begin a journey into a benevolent afterlife. And the shared death experiencers give us a glimpse into what this, uh, the initial stages of the afterlife look like. It's highly relational. We see a strong correlation between the dying and the strength of their relationship with the experiencer. So oftentimes, of course, loved ones, caregivers, what have you. And the other kind of helpful uh, analogy is that it's very similar to the NDE. In fact, when we talk about this, Raymond Moody and I have had many conversations and we have come to an agreement that the total capacity, if there was a, a limit to this, but the, the, the phenomena that are available in a near-death experience and a shared death experience, they're basically the same. And every experience is unique and different. Well, that I think that's that's very true. I, that was one of the reasons I was so confused about all that early on was hearing all these stories that were of shared death of people who were not near death themselves, but they accompany others along. And and I believe I agree with you. I think the realms are, are extremely similar. I mean, it's really uh, in many ways the same experience, depending on how deep and the exact nature of it. So fascinating. Tell, tell us a bit more about your background and how in the world you came to be interested in shared death experiences. Well, uh, you, like me, have that, that foundational near-death experience. For me, it happened when I was 17 years old. Uh, just a pretty typical ski weekend with uh, some friends up in Lake Tahoe and had a really bad fall. And in that fall, I crushed my spine and was catapulted instantly out of my body. And what I remember next was moving away from my body on the ski slope, uh, very much at peace, very much comfortable, a sense that I'd been there before. I was just observing. And eventually I was so far from my body that I could see planet Earth almost like a satellite picture as we see it today. I noticed at that point that my life was being reviewed in front of me like a movie. Every action I'd ever taken was shown to me. And then I entered this rib tunnel and through this glossy rib tunnel, I could see a beautiful hyper alive universe. I was enamored. I was enthralled. I was loving every moment of it, but then I saw the light. And for most NDE years, that's a really wonderful experience. It was for me in a certain way, except for me, it told me I was dying and I realized, oh my gosh, I have been here so many times before and I did not want to die. I had a sense that I, had to go back and finish up my life and, and, and do something. So I stopped in that light very much at that point mixed because it was so warm, so loving. And, and yet I was stopped. And then eventually I felt this pushback on my body from God. I grew up Catholic. It was very comfortable and still is for me to call that source God. And I started going back the other direction. But what I heard communicated to me was make something of your life. And that stayed with me. Uh, I came back into my body and I did not think about that experience for a long time, but it changed me in ways. Not only did I lose my identity uh, as an athletic man, um, 
you know, I just was, I was, I don't think I really ever run, ran again after that for more than, you know, a few steps because of the pain in my back. And I would have other experiences. I went to Central and South America and, and that was probably not on my trajectory as a suburban uh, young man in a culture that was mostly about developing lucrative professions. I turned away and, and really was looking for some deeper meaning. And I'm sure the shared, that near-death experience had something to do with that. I found myself in the AIDS epidemic as a social worker, uh, and I should say in San Francisco. And there I met men, primarily gay men, who had contracted the HIV virus at a time, this is late uh, 80s, early 90s, and that disease was quite um, unbearable and suffering was immense at that time. And, but I was somehow felt okay um, working closely with these men. And I would hear many stories. Uh, one in particular, I do share it in the book, but I'll share it here with uh, our viewers because it's so profound. His name was Brad, and he was he would come to me regularly. He was like a shaman in this, uh, in in this really it was this is the underclass of San Francisco, the Skid Row where people ended up because they were impoverished, and he lived in a homeless encampment in what is in those days South of Market. South of Market is different today, but in those days it was quite poor, and he he, he would come to me regularly and tell me stories. But one day he came in and he said. Uh, well, I should say first, I noticed when he walked in the door at, you know, eight o'clock in the morning, I said, Brad, what, what's up? You look really tired. Tell me. And he says, oh, Randy died last night. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. And he said, well, I'm sorry too, but it was so beautiful. And I said, beautiful, tell me. And he said to me, yes, when Randy died, my brothers, our brothers, because he lived in a, 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 a really a community of these men who were basically waiting to die one after the other. And he said, there we were, and Randy was just taking his last breaths, and we were circled around him, and then we saw him go up a, a, a cylinder of light, and then he stopped and looked back at us, and he said, thank you. And there he was. He was completely healed. He was at peace. His body was, was no longer, you know, with carposa sarcoma and, and suffering. And then he left and went up into the heavens. And when I heard that experience, my response was, wow, but I did not doubt it. And I didn't doubt it because, and I'll say this, Evan, you know what this is like. And so many of our viewers know this, what this is about. When you're speaking truth, you know it. And that's the same reason people really uh, resonated with your story in Proof of Heaven. And I think that's why um, when I tell these stories and other people tell their stories in the right context about the shared death experience, you get it. Um, and I got it and it, I didn't doubt it. I would have more experiences later when I worked in Zen hospice. And I'll just say one, because it was, a, it was a really a gateway affirming practice to me. I was at Zen hospice. I was with Ron, changed his name. And he was very close to death. He was unresponsive and had been for a number of days. I had been reading to him regularly. And on this occasion, I was reading uh, he loved Jack London stories. He was an adventurer during his life. So here I am reading Jack London, um, The Call of the Wild. <laughs> and here we are. And I'm just reading. I've been reading for a half an hour. And all of a sudden, I pop out of my body. And I am suspended above my body and Ron's body. And I'm kind of comfortable, actually, but a bit stunned. Still comfortable. And I look to my right. And there's Ron. Ron is there. He's smiling big eyes, huge white teeth. And he's telling me, look at this, William. This is where I am. This is where I've been. And in a certain way, this is where I'm going at some point. And I don't know how long that lasted, but when I went back into my body, I don't even think I stopped uh, reading, but that was a gateway experience for me. But there's something else about that experience that's profound. Here I am at the Zen Hospice Project. The, in my estimation, one of, if not the best hospices that was ever created. It's certainly in that era, it was, it was pioneering uh, based on these Buddhist principles of presence and authentic, um, you know, sensing and feeling and presence and all of those good things that we know make good hospice workers. And yet when I went to my director, Eric Pochet, who was a veteran and was one of the kindest men I'd ever met in this field, 
I shared the experience with him. And he, uh, he said, oh, William, phenomena, let it go. Phenomena rolling by. There's someone who needs you in bed six. And that was indicative because I still, I think as well-intended as so many of us are in the healthcare profession, we don't know about these experiences and we need to. And so that's what got me into this work. That's what galvanized the Shared Crossing Project. So, so after that, I met Raymond Moody. He was talking about the shared death experience and his book, Glimpses of Eternity, which you've already alluded to, Evan. And when I heard that, I just got my whole body lit up saying, this is my path, this is my calling, and I've been at it ever since then. Well, ab absolutely fascinating. And um, certainly, I think our culture can learn a lot about the value of being present and interactive at death, because there's a tremendous amount of exchange about life that occurs in those moments. And that's what brings all this into focus is so important. Also, I, I would like to point out um, the fact that you can have multiple witnesses, uh, multiple experiencers. So it's, it's different from NDEs in that respect. You get much more of an objective feel for it when you have several people involved in the vision. Uh, now, you study uh, sh shared death experiences from the perspective of not only having been an experiencer of near death yourself, but also as a psychotherapist and as a researcher. How do each of these influence your understanding of the shared death experience? Yeah, thank you. So as an experiencer, um, I know these are real. There's no doubt in my body. Uh, and, and not only that, when people start sharing their shared death experience with me, primarily it began in the consultation room, uh, but also now, you know, when we are as researchers hearing cases, you can hear these experiences as stories from the outside and they're fascinating. But when I listen to them, I hear them from the inside out. I, I hear and sense them. And I actually, in a certain sense, can go into the realms they're talking about. I, I think there's that mix between the imaginal and the real and the collective unconscious, all those beautiful uh, spaces we can go when we can allow ourselves to be drawn into this dimension, this state of consciousness that experiencers talk about when they're sharing their story. So as an experiencer, I have a sense for how, what those spaces are like and, and can feel and sense into them. And that's more, I dare say, that's at a consciousness soul level. There's not much intellectual about that. So that piece gives, and by the way, I can also tell, although it doesn't happen very much, when somebody's kind of um, maybe not having an SDE or embellishing a little bit, it doesn't, it doesn't ring the same way. So as mm -hmm. an experiencer, I have a good intuitive sense for these um, phenomena. As a clinician, uh, I have heard, so I should say, I have been so blessed to hear so many of these cases in my office. They're not always just peer shared death experience. There's also a whole spectrum of end of life experiences. And that you know, that's actually going to be the subject of my next book, The Spectrum of End of Life Experiences. And, and so those are things like uh, pre-death dreams and visions and post-death visitations and all these synchronicities that happen around uh, end of life. They're profound. They're very meaningful. And I, as a clinician, get to hear these over and over again because my practice is increasingly focused on this. So that clinical perspective uh, allows me to see and see the therapeutic value. So I wouldn't be interested in this if there were just these beautiful phenomena. It's wonderful. It's glorious. But they have such profound therapeutic value. And I'll say exactly what I learned in my uh, clinical practice that now has been borne out in the research. And that is experiencers of the SDE, similar to the NDE, will say that I know my loved one is alive and well in a benevolent afterlife. I know that I'll see them again. I no longer have a fear of death, and I now have deeper understanding for what a human life is about. And my grief is a lot more is a lot manageable. To say it specifically, that they can hold their grief in in a larger context. When we lose a loved one, it's painful. There's no getting around that. But there's a meaning making aspect when you know that your loved one is alive and well somewhere, and that you'll see them again. So those are the things that I learned in my clinical practice, and I've really learned to integrate the SDE as well as other spiritual end of life experiences into therapeutic be benefit that serves spiritual and emotional and psychological growth. And the last element you talked about, which is the researcher uh, aspect of me, and I have to say that the research piece was the last thing that I really developed. 
And I wanted, I, I realized we needed to do this to convince uh, the healthcare, uh, healthcare providers and the medical sciences that these are real. And so I came into that and I should say that, you know, we have a great team. Uh, Dr. Michael Kinsella has come on as chief of researcher and uh, Michelle Johnston has been an excellent researcher. Noel Christensen was a part of our team as well. And then Kelly uh, Rose Almeida, who's been helping as well. All of us together really uh, have, you know, crunched a lot of case. I say crunch because researchers crunch data, but, um, but we bring these, we, we listen to these people, we really study them. And, we, and the thing about it is we have so much compassion for each one of these persons and their stories. Uh, because the stories, as you'll see in my book, there's 28 stories, and they are, they're painful when you talk about, you know, uh, mothers, you know, losing children and spouses dying prematurely of cancer. So that's painful, but the SDE provides comfort, support, and ease uh, as they make their way through it. And one thing we see in the SDE for sure is it is a path of transformation. And that's why we need to honor these. Similar to you, Evan, and your NDE, these experiences invite transformation. And But we as a culture, especially as a mental health culture and as spiritual care, we need to honor these experiences and use them to help people evolve. Well, absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. And I must say, even though there is a lot of pain in the stories you share, there's a tremendous redemptive value in this beautiful uh, kind of silver lining to these stories, too, as people transform. Uh, as you're saying, these are very important in our kind of growth of understanding of our basically our purpose for being. Now, you mentioned uh, early on the definition of an SDE, but would you care to expand a bit on the uh, key features of a shared death experience, especially in relation to uh, say near death experiences, any uh, particular differences? Yeah, so most of the features are very similar. For example, uh, we see this light, uh, this glorious luminous light, which is I think the feature, well I know it is the primary feature in the NDE. We don't see it as predominantly in the SDE. In other words, in the NDE, it's often luminous and huge. And I think I'm, I could be getting in front of myself here, but between two thirds and three quarters of NDE experiencers will see the light in a big way. In the SDE, I think it's closer to about a quarter, but light, and when you talk about that light that you're heading towards, so to speak. But in the SDE, the light in other ways is also present, like as a cascade, as a channel, as a bridge that you're traveling through. So there's a big similarity there. Um, other similarities are with the heavenly realms, the uh, life review comes up as well. There's a boundary. Experiencers talk about you know, being with their loved ones as they're transitioning and all of a sudden they realize, oh, I can go no farther. And you know, the dying will then of course go on and the experiencer will come back to their life. So those are the primary similarities. Uh, the other thing to say is there all these experiences are filled with sublime feelings. You know, the word, the term we hear all the time is ineffable. Can I, I don't have the words for it. Um, so, so that makes it difficult as a researcher when you're dealing with ineffable data. <laughs> so, um, but we've made the best of it because people really do, you know, they do express it more with their heart and their metaphors and analogies and what have you. In terms of differences, a, a, a difference is this. And this is the pr most profound feature in the SDE. That is that you see your departed loved one. F like I said earlier, just over half of our experiences report that they see the dying loved one in their transition. Now, of course, that wouldn't be possible in NDE because in NDE, you are the person who's brushing with death. In this case, you're a caregiver loved one and you're observing this. We see that in, like I say, just over half. The other thing we see is 16% of our cases uh, will report that they see an elevated being of some type, either an angel described as an angel or a being of light or a guide, and it's benevolent. Uh, we even, you know, I came up with this term because I kept seeing this force, sensing and feeling this force that was guiding the whole process. And I named it the conductor because it seemed like it was guiding this process. And that's, a, that's something that I found you know, a few years ago and I've been focused on it um, and will continue to study the role of this conductor, sometimes seen, sometimes unseen, uh, a guiding hand in the transition. 
The other, the other one that you see is deceased relatives. That's also seen in the NDE. So that's a common one, just seeing deceased relatives. We have 13% in the, um, in the SDE. I think it's a bit higher in the NDE, but I'm not exactly sure of that. So there's a bit of a compare and contrast in the main features. Okay. How long have shared death experiences been documented? Well, this is a great question too, because um, when we do the lit reviews on this, uh, literature reviews, I should say, we know that in the late 1800s, the London Society for Cyclical Research, uh, they were identifying these. They called them um, death apparitions. Uh, and so they noticed that at the time of death, there's even a, a beautiful graph they have that at the time of death, there's a lot more of this uh, engagement across the veil, whether they see, see, you know, well, it's basically the near death and, and uh, shared death phenomena. You may see other beings, you may see deceased relatives, um, all sorts of uh, peering into the veil, which I've already described. So we know that they were seeing this in the cases they were collected primarily in the UK, but they were more focused on the experience of the dying and less on the caregiver loved ones. We move forward a bit, same society, uh, London Society for Cyclical Research, and Sir William Barrett in 1926 uh, publishes a book, Deathbed Visions. And in this book, uh, he, he cites 58 uh, visions, if you will. And, you know, uh, was working on this with uh, Michael Kinsella, our chief of research, and we feel like it's 17, 18 of these are... Uh, bona fide shared death experience. Hard because the descriptive language for these cases isn't clear cut, but conjecture would suggest that these are shared death experiences. So they were captured. We know that the scientists at that time were capturing them. You have to go all the way up uh, into the late 90s before you hear people really start talking about them again. But it really wasn't until Raymond Moody uh, wrote Glimpses of Eternity that he identified uh, the shared death experience and, and really popularized the term. Important to note, Raymond really looked at shared death experiences at bedside because that's the ones he was hearing. It was Dr. Peter Fennick and his wife, Elizabeth Fennick and their research team that had these deathbed coincidences that they were seeing also in the UK and Northern Europe. And he wasn't calling them a shared death experience. He was calling them deathbed coincidences, but they're remote SDEs. And so mm -hmm. when I started doing my review, this is now eight, 10 years ago, I started trying to tease apart, are these the same or are they different? And as I worked with them, seeing case after case, I realized, no, they're the same thing. The phenomena is the same thing. And this is why you know, I developed these typologies. You'll see that in the book to really break the down the different types of SDEs. And then with the research that we did in the last three or four years, we really were able to validate the merit of those typologies and to say that remote and bedside SDEs are largely the same. Right. Can you, can you summarize a bit the, the kind of main features of your research into shared death experiences? When you say the, the main, like, uh, tell me more what you're looking there for. Uh, just uh, the uh, a kind of, I guess I'm more interested in uh, helping people to have these events themselves, the oh. research that supports practical means by which uh, people can enhance their chances of having a shared death experience with a loved one who is passing. Great. Uh, thank you. I'm glad I clarified that. Um, because so this is this is a funny coincidence or maybe not so funny at all. But the first study that uh, the Share Crossing Research Initiative did in 2013 was really to test the methods, the protocols, as we call them, the share crossing protocols, to see if we could enable the SDE. And, and we had five groups of about 16 people average in each one of them. And to get into that group, to get into the study, you had to, be, had to have a caregiver or a loved one and somebody who was closer to death. So someone elderly or someone with a diagnosis, and we did let a few others in as well, but that was we, that's, those are the people we're interested in studying. The idea was I would teach these protocols that I had uh, crafted. And when I say that I crafted them, I wanna be really clear about how I crafted them. I, when I met Raymond, as soon as he started talking about the SDE, I, my body just kind of lit up and said, oh my God, this is, I wanna do this work. And I realized at that moment, you know, I know about this landscape. Like I've been across this landscape many, many, many times. 
And I think I can help people make this um, journey through this uh, geography from this life to what lies beyond. So I developed these uh, protocols and taught them over five weeks and five sessions, about two hours each session. And the idea was, can we study or measure whether these people have these experiences? We had one flaw in the research, and that was people were feeling better after this class, after this course. And people with terminal illnesses were kind of rebounding and doing better. Most people, not everybody. We did have somebody who unfortunately died in one of the courses, but you know he was very advanced in his cancer. Uh, but most mm -hmm. people kind of had a rebound effect. And so it was hard to track the data. So, but I will say this, as we move forward now, and we're looking at what are the conditions that can enable an SDE, what we know is this, is that if your relationship to, the per to these people and to yourself, if you're the dying, if your relationship to yourself around your life and to the people in your life, your loved ones, is good, that means you don't have any unfinished business. Uh, if you've worked through it, if you can say to your loved ones together and accept, say something like, you know that I'm going to be dying. You can put that illusion that you're going to keep living forever if you're in your deathbed. If you can come and join with your caregivers and acknowledge that you're dying and together, heartfelt, connect with each other and say, thank you. I love you. It has been a pleasure and honor to have spent this portion of life with you. I'm dying now. Goodbye. I hope to see you again. If you can bring that level of integrity, of consciousness, of heart, of love, that seems to form the soul-to-soul -soul bond that stretches across the human realm into the what lies beyond. I can also say to you that it really helps if you have uh, mindfulness practices to the extent that you can, uh, to the extent that you've had and, and, and apply a prayer practice, a meditation practice, a yoga practice, something that allows you as this is now on the experiencer side, this is the caregiver loved one. As your loved one is dying, if you can stay in that zone, if you can attune to what is happening to your departing loved one, to what's going on in the room, if you can have that presence of mind, then you can attune to what is happening to your dying, departing loved one. And I think that's how you, quite frankly, hitch a ride with your loved one into this beautiful afterlife. So, but to tell you the truth, Evan, we are still learning and exploring what are the levers that, uh, levers that facilitate an SDE. But that's what we've got up to this point. Well, I think it's very, very important work because one of the kind of holy grails of, of NDEs is to get some kind of driving mechanism so that we could actually try and duplicate it in the lab. People have mentioned psychedelics, but they're, they're not a very good driver at all. They just give a tiny glimpse. Uh, but I think meditation is and centering prayer, these are beautiful ways of going within and, and kind of uh, yielding fertile ground for this kind of connection uh, at these major transitions. Now, as much as I love the scientific research and analysis in your book, by far my favorite part are the stories, fascinating uh, shared death stories that you have in that book. Uh, and I'd, I'd like for you to share uh, some of your favorites, if you could. Yeah, that's a tough question. Part of the hardest one you've given me yet, because I love so many of them. Um, yeah, they're great. Yeah, I love all of them. And, you know, it was really difficult to choose what stories go in this book, because almost everyone who shared their story. And I hope, I know that there are so many people from our research uh, listening right now. And I wanna thank each and every one of you for your contribution, because whether you, you know, are in the book or not, you helped us learn more about this. Um, but I will share one, uh, I'll share a couple actually. There's this beautiful story with uh, Amelia B and she's in the UK um, and we call her Amelia B. Amelia has a son, Tom. Uh, and Tom is 10 years old, and Tom gets diagnosed with a terminal aggressive cancer. Tom would go on to live three more years, and Amelia would travel with her family to uh, Sloan Kettery in New York City, where she had a sister to get cancer treatment, and back to the UK, many you know, transatlantic journeys, but eventually Tom uh, succumbed to cancer. 
And on the, di- on the day that he died, Amelia describes being in his bed with him and his breathings labored. And all of a sudden, a beautiful woman. And she says that. And the way she describes it, you know, it's, I can't do justice to it. But in the book, uh, we really take time to get it right. She says, I saw this beautiful lady, such a beautiful lady. I was so struck by the beauty of this lady. And, and she was so peaceful and so wise, but she was um, urgent. She had an urgency. She had a purpose and a mission. I want to go sidebar here. This is the conductor. This being that comes in, that's facilitating the transition of our loved ones. There she is. Amelia's in contact with her. Amelia takes a sense of a peace, knowing that this beautiful woman is here. When she opens her eyes, she realized that Tom is taking his last breaths and he, then he dies. At the same time uh, that Amelia, just at this time that Tom is transitioning, Amelia's sister, um, Charmin, comes in. Charmin comes in and she stops at the doorway. And what Charmin describes is she sees Tom elevating out of his body. She sees him rising out of his body and she stops and watches this. At the same time, they're having this experience, two people corroborating the transition of Tom from this life to the beyond and and seemingly escorted, uh, could be a bit of a stretch, but escorted by this beautiful lady who had come to take Tom to uh, his home in the spirit realm. So there's a beautiful one that I love. Uh, but I'll share another one that actually we start the book off with. And the reason I like this one is because it's two mothers giving birth to children on two different continents. Michelle Johnston, who happens to be uh, our senior researcher now, she came to join us after um, we, we met. I shared uh, some research with the organization she's a part of, Helping Parents Heal. And she uh, heard me talk. And so she came to join our research. And so Michelle shares a story of her, she's in Sydney, Australia, where she's from, and she's uh, giving birth to uh, Ben, her child. And Ben is born and eventually he dies within a few days. And what she describes during this time is her father appearing and her father had recently died and Michelle intuitively strong, kind of has a sense that this isn't good that her father's appearing. She kind of knows that, you know, I don't, I don't want you here, dad. This is not, you know, we want to keep Ben here. Eventually, um, Ben dies. And it it is, it is very clear to Michelle that her father was there to help Ben uh, on his transition. And, and Michelle's father had been a very kind and community oriented man. So it would make sense that he would be there and do this service uh, for his family. Take that experience and now take this experience from Elizabeth H, West Virginia, a headmaster of a school. And she is giving birth to Nicholas. But Nicholas, uh, she gets into a distress in her labor. And as this is happening, she sees her four uh, grandparents appear, all of them. And she describes this very well, saying that her grandparents, they're, you know, she had a good relationship with her grandparents but not nearly as loving, as kind, as forward, as there to support her as she felt in this moment. And her paternal grandmother comes forward and says, you know, it's emotional. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Says, I've got Nicholas. I'll take Nicholas. And so for Liz to know that her baby, who she's carried for you know, nine, 10 months, is now going to be cared for for her family on the other side, that's quite a message. So the loss, as we all know, and Liz and Michelle will speak to a lifetime of healing around the loss of their children. But both of them have said the shared death experience provides them insight and comfort that they don't know how they would, made it, would have made it through this experience without it. 
So these experiences, as you can say, you know, I remember them and I feel them and they're so profound and they offer such healing. So those are some of the experiences. And I can assure you that, you know, that's just three of 28 and every one of them can oh. bring me to tears. Well, I agree. I mean, I, I, my eyes messed it up several times reading this book because you tell the story so beautifully and richly, and it really does show how this kind of knowledge, this kind of experience, especially, uh, you know, as people read about them and learn more about them can be extremely comforting. You know, there's a lot of bereavement, a lot of grief in this world right now, COVID pandemic, uh, economic uh, challenge and all that. Uh, uh, and it's really been tough on people and a lot of loss. And this kind of thing can be very reassuring to realize that we have this very fundamental connection uh, in, in the spiritual realm that's very real. And the, the coalescence of information from the hospice literature, from you know ter ter terminal care, uh, NDEs, shared death, all of it starts to show this beautiful, comforting fabric of ongoing connection of souls. How common are shared death experiences? Oh boy, <laughs> that is the mystery of all mysteries. Because, you know, when I would go to the research, the conferences, uh, various conferences, especially the more research oriented conferences, and I would share uh, my initial findings, so to speak, or my theories about the SDE. Uh, and then I'd always show videos and the researchers and others would come up to me and say, well, we know these experiences happen but how did you get so many cases? And, and I have to tell you, it has never been hard for me to get cases. If I give a talk at say, you know, IANS, Evan, where we spent so many conferences together, every time I gave a talk at IANS and maybe, you know, whatever, a hundred people in the room, let's say afterwards, I would get a couple dozen cases. So mm -hmm. there, you know, maybe that's a, you know, a more of a home team audience, but I gave talks mental, you know, at mental health conferences and, hospices locally and all over the place, different groups, spiritual communities, people would come up to me. I never had any shortage of cases. We're still sitting right. here right now with, you know, a, a, a few dozen cases we can, we can interview and process. Uh, I say yeah. that if you're listening and you've had a, a, a story to tell, please contact us because we're still collecting for sure and documenting, but we really don't know. But I have this theory and I'm just going to put it out there. I have nothing to back it with in the research. And that is this. If, if it's being present at the portal of death, that is the gateway to the SDE. And if we as people or even communities of people can practice consciousness and comfortability and receptivity to death and dying, if we can get to be at peace with and wise about how we die so that we can escort our loved ones through death with dignity, not with fear, not with trepidation, not with that clinginess to prolong human life at any cost, if we can put that aside and say, let's go for a good death. Let's let our people die with dignity and let's surround them and let's be present. Let's pray with them. Let's meditate with them. If we can do that, I think we could open a floodgate for these experiences. And I have another theory about this. I think the reason why in the Middle Ages, Ars Moriende uh, is this art of dying that was practiced in uh, the Middle Ages in Europe. And there were these monasteries that were essentially hospices where people would go to die in the villages and travelers and what have you. But they would gather as a community. And, and it, was a, it was a community event when people were dying. They would go to the monastery. They would, there'd be the singing of hymns. There'd be all this beautiful you know, religious practices. And it was appropriate for them because it was the religion that they believed in. I'm not saying that religion be right for us now. We need to find our own practices. But I think they were, they were honoring something that they could feel that the transition of a spirit from this life to the next was perhaps the most beautiful human experience that there is. Birth, certainly, as well, but death, for sure, as well. And I think it was a community happening. And I, I dream about the time when we can become so comfortable with death and dying that when our loved ones are declining, we don't have to be clingy. We can say, ah, wow, how do we prepare for this? How are we going to do this? Get our loved ones together and say, you know, 
What's the best way that we can choreograph your, your death? How can we serve you? What do you need to close out this life? If we can bring that consciousness to death and dying, I think we're going to see a lot of SDEs. That is a beautiful point. And it really has to do with uh, how much these kind of experiences and this kind of understanding can greatly enhance how we make our decisions to live in the here and now with really everything we do. I think uh, this, this kind of knowledge will greatly transform uh, people around the world. And the good news is through your book, people can individually start on that pathway right now. What would you say is the relationship between the experiencer and the dying? The relationship between the experiencer and the dying in terms of uh, the importance of that relationship or, um, yeah. yeah. Just, uh, I mean, in terms of uh, kind of qualities of empathy, oh. uh, any kind of sense of resonance and connection. Yeah. Uh, you know, what is it that enables the uh, experiencer and the dying to meet up in the, this uh, kind of spiritual realm? This once again is a mystery, but I, I will share a few cases that can shed some light on this question. When we did that first study, when I trained people in those first five groups in 2013, 14, and early 15, um, one of the things we noticed was when people did die, I'm thinking of a beautiful case, um, which and I know his name is Francis and his mother Diana died. Uh, and he did the training with me. He's a, actually the family's reasonably well known in Santa Barbara. Um, and and um, Diana was dying of ovarian cancer. And Francis had done the training with her. And he was so ready to sh have the shared death experience. But his sister, uh, uh, Margaret, came down. And, and she hadn't had a lot of time with her mother because she lived up in Oregon. She comes down. And Francis is on the phone you know, doing some funeral arrangements. And Margaret describes seeing her mother rise out of her body and a beautiful, huge, majestic uh, kind of male figure comes down that she kind of recognized as perhaps um, her uncle, uh, Diana's brother, who was in the, I think the British Navy or something. And he is summoning her out, coaxing her out of her physical body and bringing her up into him. And uh, once again, another appearance of the conductor. Uh, and, but Margaret has this beautiful SDE. In fact, she, she quotes this saying, when this um, conductor, this being comes into, she sees it come into the room, if you will, what he says to her is, I've got this step aside, I've got it. Once again, the urgency, the purposefulness that we see in the conductor, as uh, similar to the beautiful lady that Amelia talked about, and then mm -hmm. it rises up. But the point being I'm sharing here is that here it is that we often see this. Somebody gets the SDE. Sometimes it's one or two people, but oftentimes it's not everybody. But why not? And we don't know why that is. Once again, shrouded in mystery. But maybe, and Francis even said this, and it's such a, you know, sees the beauty of, Fran of uh, Francis here. He says, you know, if my mom had to choose one person, I'm glad she chose Margaret because Margaret hadn't been able to be with her the way I was in, in the preparation for her death. So maybe, you know, I dare say, you know, maybe they only get so much uh, capital, if you will, to apply to this event. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that the recipient of this experience, oftentimes it's either a healing for them. Um, in other words, they may be the one in the family that needs to have the experience to have healing. I mean, I know that when my father died, uh, this is just you know a year and a half ago now, um, I didn't have a, a great relationship with my father. It was a challenging relationship. Uh, my brother had a good relationship with him and so did my sister, but I had the SDE with him. Now, granted, I probably am the one who's more able to have that in a certain way because it's what I do with my life, but still I had it. And, you know, uh, my family is relatively spiritual. They could have had it as well. Um, but I think if there was one in the family that needed healing with my father, it was me. And, and, I, and, I, and I had it. So I do think there's some, dare I say, divine equalization going on or something that's helpful. And, and once again, that's a bit of a stretch perhaps, but I'd like to see that it's that way. And we'll learn more about it as we study more. Well, I think so. And, and it's certainly an observation in NDEs that your fear of death just evaporates once you've had this kind of experience. And 
certainly I would say the same kind of thing applies in the SDE. Uh, it's a beautiful vision of this kind of ongoing spiritual connection beyond the physical realm. And, th and that, that is something that I really uh, appreciated about your book is how clear uh, that kind of comfort and uh, uh, power of this kind of experience to transform us. Uh, one thing that uh, this obviously brings up and as a neuroscientist, uh, neurosurgeon, I'm fascinated by this and have been uh, you know, for many years since my NDE and trying to make sense of it, what do you think shared death and near death experiences tell us about the mind brain relationship and about consciousness itself? Well, you're saving the tough questions for the end of I mean, way to go. Uh, so, yeah, you know, um, well, I'll say this. I mean, I know that in my first, my second NDE, which I, I didn't share, but it's, it's really quickly, I was hovering above my body in the ICU of Kaiser Oakland Hospital. I had a rare blood disease. It was idiopathic thrombocytopenia, kind of a low platelet condition. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was at risk of drowning in my blood, apparently. That's what I was told. And here I am hovering in the ICU above my body. And I, then I'm listening to the nurses talk and the doctor comes in and he's talking. And what I realized was there's my body down below. This is similar to the experience I had with Ron. There's my body down below and here I am up above with Ron. And this is in the Zen hospice. But here I am in the ICU. What is absolutely clear to me is that physical body is not me. That physical body is not me. Whatever I call myself, you know, William or I or me or this observing aspect of myself, which is my, I identify with this observing mindfulness part of myself. I believe that's the enduring part of ourselves that goes from this life to the beyond. And we can talk about the whole physics of that. In fact, you know, Evan, you would be much more versed at that than I am, since I know you've devoted a great deal of study there. But for the purposes of like, you know, the, the average person who's just trying to get comfortable with death and wonder what happens to us when we die, I think both the NDE and the SDE show us quite clearly that some part of ourselves, soul, spirit, essence goes on after this human life. And we should take comfort in that. Because where we go with every indication, not just our research, but anyone who studies afterlife research that I'm familiar with suggests a benevolent afterlife. So, you know, now granted, there are these, you know, fire and brimstone, hell and purgatory and all that kind of stuff. I think that stuff's kind of lost uh, hold um, in, in, in the more um, studied people, if you will, and even the more spiritual people right. at this point. Um, so... Yeah, I am strongly in the camp, you know, as an experiencer, I can't, my research can't prove this. I don't think anyone's research can really prove it at this point, but, you know, I think we're breaking through on, you know, quantum physics and new physics and what have you. But from my own felt sense as an experiencer, and as I hear these stories on my consultation office, I feel sense, and I'll dare say no, uh, from where I sit, there's some aspect of myself and everybody else that survives human death and goes into a benevolent afterlife. I, I think they certainly inform us a lot about uh, uh, kind of fundamental concepts of, of kind of God and afterlife and uh, a, con a sense of connection, um, a sense of oneness that we all uh, share through these experiences. Uh, from my point of view, your book will do a tremendous uh, uh, benefit, give a tremendous benefit to this world by helping wake people up, not only to these kind of realities of these experiences, which are very common, uh, but also to the power and the value of them and why it's worth, you know, trying to have an SDE to uh, participate in, in the death of a loved one or something like that. And I, I suspect that uh, over the next five to 10 years, At Heaven's Door will have a tremendous positive influence on how our culture at large uh, views death and especially views life. Uh, and looks at how uh, we can best live our lives to our fullest potential uh, with this uh, rich sense of connection with others. Um, I think we're getting close to the end of the hour, but I would like to encourage people uh, to read this book. I've, I've read it several times now because I've just enjoyed it so much. And uh, I really congratulate you, William, on this, uh, this beautiful work, which I think will bring tremendous comfort to a lot of people in a very uh, kind of troubled world. Uh, and not only through the knowledge that you impart, 
but the practical tools about how people can engage, you know, through meditation, through uh, being conscious and aware at the time uh, that a loved one is, is passing from the physical plane. And it really just kind of opens people's eyes to the tremendous potential we hold as human beings. So I'd like to just close by congratulating you on this absolutely wonderful book and uh, kudos to you. And uh, we look forward to all the changes that it'll bring to this world. Well, Evan, thank you so much for um, you know, being here tonight and being a support for me and for this work and, and for your own message to the world. And I'm just gonna invite uh, all of our viewers that if you wanna, you know, I think you've got a good taste for who Evan is. And I can say that when I first met Evan, um, you were a wonderful person then, and I, I still remember that, but the person that you become, all I do is, all I know is that as I spent time with you, the textures, the aliveness, the full heartedness, you have, you have used your experiences to become a wise and compassionate man deeper and deeper. And so, uh, it's an honor to call you a friend. And well, thank you so much. And of course, I'm grateful to all who have shared their stories with me because that is, has helped me to grow tremendously, not just my own NDE, but the thousands of people who've shared their near-death and shared death experiences have greatly contributed to my own understanding and kind of sense of peace about the nature of our existence. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. And I wanna just refer people, if you wanna learn more about Evan and his work, go to evanalexander.com also united in hope and healing.com and you'll find that on our facebook page and if you want any other information about evan's work or my work you can always get us at sharecrossing.com um, so thank you all for uh, joining us for this evening so appreciate everyone's interest and if you do get the book really would appreciate a review because as you know good reviews we listen to them we read them and people who are looking for good literature uh respond to to educated smart people sharing their uh, impressions of this book and any other book you like. So thank you. I say good night and goodbye to all of you. Happy trails and be well.